Um, let's talk about some aspects of um, regulating gene expression. We've already learned one of the mechanisms uh, by a microRNA. Remember how they can um, control the stability of uh, mRNA transfer. Now, we're going to talk about a couple more mechanisms. And the first mechanism is going to be so called ribose Ribose switch is a structure in the molecule of RNA. So imagine that this blue is the RNA molecule, okay? So this will be this therapy loop structure right here will be a ribose switch. There's something ribose switch. Now ribose switch um, in this image is in a long position. Okay, on, which means there is a molecule of RNA, which is moving down a molecule of DNA, producing MR. Does that make sense? Let me hear it. So if you look at this image here. So you've got you've got RNA that is produced during transcription. That's a transcriptional regulation right here. Okay, produced during transcription. RNA polymerase reads DNA, produces mRNA. Ribose switch is on. Everything is going smooth. And then some small molecule binds to the ribose switch. Changing the structure of the RNA. Look at this. Okay, now please understand this whole structural regulation, like one hairpin loop, two hairpin loops, it's totally hypothetical. I'm just giving an example. So in this case, ribose switch turns out to be in the position of just a small molecule, this brown part, a small molecule, is bound to the ribose switch. You see, it turned it on. What does that mean in terms of the regulation of gene expression? It means that at this particular moment, RNA polymerase dissociates from DNA and transcription stops. So let's go over it one more time. What you can see here is that when ribose switch is in the on position, okay, everything goes smooth, RNA polymerase is on the, uh, uh, DNA, it produces mRNA, where ribose switch is, everything goes well. But if the regulatory molecule, some kind of a small molecule, binds to the ribose switch right here, it turns it off. And it means, like, what does it mean to turn it off? It means that this changed structure leads to dissociation of transcription coupling. Does that make sense? Now, another situation when ribose switches may <clears throat> work is with the translation. So, again, you've got ribose switch here, right? And you've got ribosome that generates a protein. Okay. So even then, that is, this is here is transcription.
This one here is translation. Look what happened. Again, small molecule binds to the ribosome and puts it in the off position. Okay, here's a small molecule right here. On. On. As the result of this binding, ribosome dissociates. And put in whether or not it is ready, is really only peptide is ready. Does that make sense to you? So I'm going to reiterate this and kind of summarize. First of all, why switch? Because it can be in on when some biochemical process is going or off when this process is terminated positions. Does that make sense? Why ribo? Because it is a part of ribonucleic acid, RNA. Does that make sense? What turns it off? Small mold. Which processes riboswitches in the mRNA can regulate? They can regulate processes where RNA participates in transcription or translation. Does that make sense? Good? Is that understood? It's really a switch. Of course, if we want to get to the details, it's much more complicated and everything, but <clears throat> why I kind of wanted to tell you about this, those are really promising targets. If we can find a drug that will turn on a rival switch, we can re artificially regulate gene expression and maybe influence you know, certain diseases or whatnot. We're good with this? Can we move on? Okay. Second regulatory mechanism that is found in bacteria is called aterols. While I'm removing this stuff, I'm going to ask you a few questions. Um, uh, can you tell me where do you keep your forks? I'm not kidding. Where, where's the drawer? In the kitchen, thank you. What about spoons? Also there, okay. Knives? Um, what about the garden equipment? In the kitchen? Now, you keep stuff that is related more or less together. That make sense? Bacteria do the same. Not only bacteria, Generally, organisms do the same. But the bacteria are particularly interesting here because what they do, they keep genes that are functionally related to each other in clusters. And these clusters are called operons. Okay? So I'm going to start with the lactose operon as an example of one of the types. Lactose is a milk sugar that bacteria can use as a source of energy and carbon. Makes sense, right? But to break down lactose, to use it, they have to produce a specific set of enzymes. I, I ask, I'm asking you a very simple question. When there is no lactose in the medium, when there's no lactose in the environment, does it make sense to produce enzymes to break down lactose. No. So keep that thought, and we're going to get back to it in two minutes. So lactose operon, like virtually any other operon, contains several parts. Contains promoter, we're going to call it P. Okay. It contains operator sequence. And it contains structural genes. We'll call them S. So promoter 
is the place for binding of RNA polymerase. Operator, well, we will figure out the function. And structural genes, one, two, and three. It's, it's just an example. They actually produce enzymes that are necessary to catabolize, to break down lactam. So far, are you following? Good. So now let's see what happens in the situation when there is no lactose around. I have a very simple question. Even when there is no lactose around, do we need the enzymes that are encoded by the gene? No. We still have RNA polymerase sitting here. It turns out that there is so-called repressor bonds to the upper end. Does that make sense so far? Let me ask you this. When there is a repressor bound to the operator sequence of DNA, which is the DNA, when there is a repressor sequence on the uh, DNA mold, here, the repressor, can RNA polymerase move to the right? Oh, operator is in the front of so that's operator is sitting, but well, not operator, repressor, I'm sorry. Repressor is sitting on the operator. Like if I stand in that door, you cannot go through. I'm not, I'm not gonna let you. Make sense? There is no transcription, genes are not expressed, enzymes are not produced. Now we're gonna add lactose. And here, what's going to happen? The motor, operator, structure, machines. Okay. Lactose is going to bind to operator. And when lactose binds to the operator, operator dissolves the not operator, sorry, repressor, I keep saying. When lactose binds to the repressor, Repressor goes away. Look at this. Repressor is bound to lactose. In this situation, RNA polymerase, can it proceed? Yeah, you see the path is clear. RNA polymerase will start transcription. Does that make sense to you? Now, it will transcribe the structural genes. There will be enzymes produced. Now, let's write down the reaction of lactose breakdown. Nothing fancy. So we have, here's this. We have lactose. Which is metabolized to some products. I don't remember the And what breaks down lactose enzymes that are encoded by structural genes? Does that make sense? Now look at this. These enzymes are produced when lactose is around. What do these enzymes do to the lactose? What do they do? Break it down. When they break it down, what happens to the levels of lactose? Huh? They decrease. Eventually, lactose is gone. What's going to happen to that complex right here? I mean, lactose is gone. Now, when there is no lactose, what happens to the repressor? Binds back to that operator sequence, transcription stops. Does that make sense? Until lactose is available again. Does that make sense? 
So in this case, in this case, the substrate of enzymatic reaction, the substrate of enzymatic reaction induces the expression of structural genes. Does it make sense? Such operon is called inducing. So far, we're good. Again, substrate of enzymatic reaction induces the expression of structural genes and the products of the structural genes will break down that substrate. Okay? Now, <clears throat> second double one, which we're going to discuss, called tryptophan. Okay. Now, what we start with is this we have DNA, we have the motor, radar. Structural genes and RNA fluids. Okay. Can RNA polymerase transcribe? Yeah. It will transcribe structural genes that will make enzymes. Okay. And Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to call them reagents are used by the enzymes encoded by structural genes to produce amino acid tryptophan. Okay? Are you following? So tryptophan, it keeps accumulating. In, and you may ask, hey, what about the repressor? Where's repressor? Well, the repressor is flowing somewhere. Now, tryptophan, <clears throat> look at this, it keeps accumulating, right? Because it is synthesized. So, tryptophan, like here. Tryptophan keeps accumulating. Eventually, tryptophan binds to the repressor, and look what happens. Can RNA polymerase transcribe now? No, because now repressor is sitting in the operator signal. Does that make sense? So look what happens. <clears throat> the product the product of enzymatic reaction represses the expression of structural genes. So other ones will repress it. Does that make sense? Again, initially, genes are expressed. The enzymes produce a product. So this product, as it accumulates, binds to the repressor, 
the contents of all the pending requests to find to that way of sequence and you feed the transcription. Once all triplet time is used by the cell, this contents does not exist anymore and we go back in the square one. Does that make sense? So you need to understand how inducible and reversible that ones are. I will not ask you to identify like you're not going to get a question. A rabbit is hot one. What kind of hot one is that? You don't know. You didn't talk about it. But I can ask you questions about black dose hot one and triple hot one. My cool. So, by the way, when we're told, recorded, we'll hold it to you. And questions? No? Okay. So, we're going to talk. About something we decided, we're going to talk about particles. Specifically, we're going to talk about Kirby stars. And here on the right, I'm going to put a list of common features. That are characteristic to <clears throat> more or less all herpes viruses. Okay. So first, let's talk about a little bit about taxonomy of herpes viruses. Herpes viruses can be divided into three groups: alpha herpes viruses, and so on. Alpha herpes viruses, beta herpes viruses, and gamma herpes. Now, right, here I'm talking about the human herpes viruses. I know nothing of <coughs> the classification of any of them. We're good so far? Before we get to <coughs> into the thick of, you know, which viruses belong to which group, we're going to talk a little bit about the process of infection, how herpes viruses infect a cell. This is, this is a cell. This is a nucleus. And this is celluloid DNA. Herpes virus, which is, and look, I'm going to just draw this scheme. So, herpes viruses all have, they are envelope viruses. They all have double stranded DNA genome. They all are by Viral standards large, <clears throat> size wise, not too large, they about 100 uh, nanometers in diameter. But uh, in terms of the genome size, for instance, cytomegalovirus has the largest genome size among all human viruses, more than 200,000 base pairs. So it Accommodates according to different estimations from 140 to 180 genes. It's really big. Okay? So, virus first has to bind to its receptor on the cell. This is an imperative. It binds to the receptor. Okay? Uh, receptors for herpes viruses, for some of them, they really Common like heparin sulfate, so for instance, cytomegalovirus technically can infect almost any cell in the human body. On the other hand, Epstein Barr virus <clears throat> infects almost exclusively epithelial cells in the cell. Okay. So it depends on the result. Virus gets into the cell, and I'm going to skip some, so it's usually endocytosis. Okay. That makes sense? Endocytic vesicle engulfs the virus and brings it. And then inside of that vesicle, uh, 
and then deliberately do it. Look, inside of that Ember City Festival, viral endome, the outer element, and capsid, the inner element, they basically get destroyed. That makes sense? Living double stranded DNA intact. Now, in the cell, in the normal human cell, DNA is supposed to be where? In which organism? DNA, huh? Being there. So, virus actually rushes to deliver its DNA into the nucleus. Does that make sense? Because if cell detects DNA in the cytoplasm, virus is screwed. Cell will go into the apoptosis, will die, and virus will die with the cell. Does that make sense? It's a protective mechanism. So viral DNA is in the nucleus. It's safe, perfect. And it starts to express its genes. Genes in a herpes virus divided into early, late, uh, sorry, immediate, early, early, and late. If you think about it, immediate early genes, they're responsible for making proteins necessary for gene expression. Um, early proteins necessary for replication of viral DNA, and late proteins, uh, formation of a capsid, uh, and formation of the envelope. Does that make sense? It's really very well timed process. They very precisely regulated. It's it's a it's a headache to study this different way. Okay, essentially, you get RNA produced, and then from RNA you get viral proteins, and then eventually you get virus particles. And virus leaves the cell, blah blah blah. You know, so it dies, whatever. So far, does that make sense? Now, one little detail about herpes virus is just going to be good. You see that space between the capsid and the envelope? Right here. This space is called tegument. Tegument is an assembly of viral proteins that are necessary for like very first moments of infection. They already made. They are essential for the virus to establish the infection. Good clear. Good? Okay. Now, what's absolutely fascinating about herpes viruses is that they all can establish latency. So, what is latency? Herpes viruses, unlike true love, will stay with you forever. They will form a circular DNA molecule in the nucleus and will remain in the nucleus in what is called episomal DNA structure for the rest of your life. Does that make sense? Now, unfortunately, um, there is a misconception that herpes viruses insert their DNA in the in the, the DNA of a cell. No, they do not. I found this misconception in I was taking the AP biology course in high school, and they say directly, oh, herpes viruses insert their DNA in the DNA of a cell. No, they do not. No. They completely separate. If a small circular DNA, it's one. Cellular DNA, it's different stuff. Does that make sense? Now, latency means that virus stays dormant in your cells. And when your immunity goes down, it gets reactivated, okay? And spreads, your immunity goes back to normal. And like in a game of whack-a-mole, knocks the virus out, it goes back into the latent form. The regulation of 
reactivation and going back to latency is super complicated and not completely clear. Does that make sense? But what we know for sure that herpes viruses reactivate usually, most frequently, say virtually all the time when your immunity is down. Does that make sense to you? And that shows that viruses, these viruses were co-evolving with humans for millions of years. Because they do not kill us, generally speaking. All they need to do is to spread, and they are freaking genius in the spread. Does that make sense? Now let's talk about specific viruses. It's kind of it's an interesting point. Uh, I I am telling you only the stuff that I can ask for. That make sense? Like you don't expect questions about uh, monkey herpes virus B or murin cytomegalovirus. No. Okay. Alpha herpes virus. I'm going to use a lot of acronyms, but I will pronounce and everything is in the notes. Herpes simplex virus one and two, what we call herpes. HSV one is common cold, okay? Not common cold, sorry, cold sore. Also known as labial herpes. Now, where this virus establishes labels? Neurons. Okay. Now, these viruses establish latency in neurons. If we're talking about Label herpes, it's usually sensory neurons of the various cranial nerves. If we're talking about HSV2, that's the genital herpes. Okay. I personally don't think there's anything, you know, shameful. In my opinion, it's over, you know, over exaggerated. I don't see any difference between sexually transmitted diseases and respiratory transmitted diseases. People breathe and people have sex, it's fine. So HSV2 causes basically cold sores that have a genital. Okay? What's interesting about this virus, first of all, the rate of prevalence. How many people have it? HSV1, multiple studies show that by the age of 55, 60, almost 100% of population have it. Labial herpes. HSV2. The genital herpes, the percentage is lower, things around 20, 25 by that age. Okay. Second interesting thing. It doesn't cause much of a trouble for people who are in the capital. Once you become in the compromise, let's say immunosuppressive therapy or that would be AIDS, that's a good problem. Uh, since herpes simplex virus sits in the neurons, it easily travels to the brain. Causes encephalitis, herpes virus encephalitis is usually okay. Another old oh, yeah, yeah, newborns. Yeah, yeah. Uh, awful, absolutely awful, terrible. Usually lifetime, usually lifetime disability if they survive. It's very, very lethal. It's awful. HSV and as well as of CMV. Oh my God. In newborns, it's terrible. Absolutely. Okay. Another alpha herpes virus is BZV or varicella zoster virus. You know it as chickenpox. Chickenpox also establishes latency in neurons. This time, mostly neurons uh, of the Spinal nerves. Now, you all know how chickenpox manifests itself when we kids, you know, if you had it, if you, if, oh, you saw someone who had it. Brings us to another kind of similarity. Transmission routes for all herpes viruses, bodily fluids. Okay. Uh, BZV can be transmitted by respiratory. Okay. And they usually are acquired in the early age. 
Now, a few things about chickenpox. First of all, it's one of the most contagious diseases that we have. Compared to chickenpox, coronavirus is vague. Okay. However, I can tell you this winter, I was in close contact, extended, prolonged close contact with two people that had chicken food, like clinical manifested chicken food. Didn't have it. Not a trace. Right? And as far as I remember, I never had it as a kid. I don't know. Yes. You can, yes, technically you can. If your immune system does not form robust immune response first time, yeah. Um, well, if the, it's fairly easily to diagnose now because they can see PCR and confirm that it is. Um, there are some other things that I can think of if you are in the middle school and there is something on your head. Oh, yeah, then most of them. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, you can get chicken pox twice. It's not frequent, it's very rare actually. Now, what are the main problems? If you have, I never had chicken pox, I have no idea. I, was I, know, I know that you feel like shit, like from what other people told me. Okay? The problem for us as adults, shingles. When you approach, shingles can happen in people who are like 30, but generally when you approach, approach the age of 55, you can develop reactivation of the virus and this thoracic nerves, okay, and that leads to rash and pain and, and, and itching, and it runs for weeks, and it's really, really unpleasant, okay? Uh, luckily, we have a vaccine. You can take shingles vaccine. It will boost your immunity and prevent it from developing shingles, even if you had chicken pox. Okay? Um, consider it sort of a, a good advice. I know a person who had uh, chicken pox with shingles in the eyes. It is extremely painful, and uh, it was kind of risky because that person could develop the actual either. Did not, but never do it. Um, again, immunocompromised people, like severely immunocompromised, very cellular zoster can lead to uh, encephalitis. Because it infects neurons in, in retrograde fashion through the spinal cord, you know, all the way up to the back. Does that make sense? And yeah, we do have a vaccine against chicken pox. Everybody knows that. If you were born before a certain after a certain year, you probably vaccine. Beta herpes virus, cytomegalovirus. Quite frankly, in um, does nothing, but seriously, okay, nothing. Uh, prevalence, uh, depending on the cohort, but there are studies showing that in some populations, it can reach up to 90%, people positive for So essentially, the initial infection usually happens very early, well, relatively early in life, like in the child care, because children uh, notoriously share body fluids with each other, Mostly saliva. Um, usually asymptomatic, they manifest as a mild cold or very mild case of pneumonia. Okay? That makes sense? Uh, it is associated, although kind of a stretched association, with cardiovascular disease. It is thought to make it worse, like if you already have, say, atherosclerosis or hypertension, CMV can worsen. That makes sense? Now CMV, although it can infect almost every cell in the human body, it is latent in monocytes, white monocytes. In immunocompromised patients, it wreaks havoc, one of the major contributors to mortality in AIDS patients. In newborns, it is terrifying. So some photographs, I have some one in the notes. 
I send more. A neonatal CME is a terrible condition, uh, usually leaves children with the um, cognitive impairments, motor impairment, like it's really bad. Believe me, it's like motor, when I say cogn severe cognitive impairments, severe motor impairment. Um, I know that like when I was in Russia, CMV in the first trimester of pregnancy is a very, very strong uh, sort of doctor would suggest to terminate pregnancy because chances are either baby is not going to make it or will be debilitated. Okay. That makes sense? Donna herpes virus. Epstein Barr virus. Epstein Barr. And the causes are coma herpes virus. We're going to talk about EB. We're going to make sure that we can finish each year. So here in, 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 in the face of EB, you see a positive agent of infectious mononucleosis or mono. We infect epithelial cells and then establish um, latency there and B cell. Now, when you have mono, you actually manifest the signs of infection of both cell types. The sore throat and cough is due to the infection of epithelial cells. Swollen lymph nodes is due to the infection of the cell. Um, after Epstein Barr virus establishes latency, usually you know, people don't notice this. However, it is strongly associated with two cancers uh, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, that's the cancer that is derived from nasopharyngeal epithelium, and Burkitt lymphoma, the B cell lymphoma. So it leads to uh, malignant transformation. Does that make sense? Please understand. It's not like it's not like if you have mono, you're going to have those two cancers. But yeah, you have a higher risk. Okay. That makes sense. It's also implicated in quote unquote collaborating with the coronavirus, because other cancers of head and neck and other cancers. Of there's no vaccine, that do That makes sense. The post-sarcoma herpes virus, if my memory serves me well, it is latent in the fibroblast. And it's quite a peculiar infection. It was a skin cancer. So if you look at the name, Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus. Uh, it is relatively, it's more common in people of the Mediterranean, not just Mediterranean descent, people from the Mediterranean region, they are around the uh, Mediterranean Sea. And it is also a what's called hallmark infection, people with AIDS, not HIV, not AIDS. You see what I'm saying? So uh, if you see a patient who walks in with various symptoms, so breath. There's a bunch of stuff that you can notice about the person. But one very characteristic symptom are purple to brown spots all over the body. That's Kaposi sarcoma herpes virus infection, and that's a skin cancer. Unfortunately, it's really, really hard. Okay. Now, I hope I painted a pretty good picture about herpes virus. Okay. Um, I'm going to add some more. So we're going to add high prevalence. As one of my former colleagues used to say, that herpes viruses are the group that puts on you. And uh, mild, generally mild infection. So in immunocompetent individuals, herpes virus is supposed to be mild infection. When we talk about immunocompromised, that's good. And the good news is all these viruses can be treated if you have a clinical infection. You can use a drug called a cyclovir. 
the prescription not in the United States. It's a nucleoside animal. It inhibits DNA polymerase of the virus, essentially preventing it from replicating its DNA and, you know, stopping it from reproducing its strength in the body. Does that make sense? Any questions about this stuff? No? Then I'm going to tell you this thing. It's really like, this is what I like to teach it. I have a chance to update you on like most recent research. So everybody knows purpose simplex virus type one, cold source, no community. About a year ago, um, the study was published. And the study was relatively simple. So what authors do? They took brains from deceased individuals, right? And they grouped like really old individuals. I'm talking 70, 80 years old. Right? And they grouped those folks into two groups. One, severe Alzheimer's disease, clinically severe Alzheimer's. And two, eh, not so much. Okay? And they confirmed the clinical diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease by um, basically brain bias. People were dead, so nobody cared, right? So they, they checked that there are signs of Alzheimer's. Beta amyloid plaques and tau protein fibers, all classes. So they grouped them very tightly, and then they started to look for the signs of herpes virus infection in the body. And what they found is that those lesions beta amyloid plaques and valve protein fibers are strongly associated with the presence of herpes virus nucleic acid. They didn't find real virus, but they found nucleic acid. Does that make sense? When virologists heard it, and a bunch of infectious disease specialists heard it, they said, oh, that's bullcrap. Because if herpes is in the brain, that's herpetic encephalitis, that's death. If it's if it's in 70 years old, that's it. Forget about Alzheimer's, the person's dead. But all those people, they kind of died peacefully. They didn't die of encephalitis. Or so the question is, does herpes contribute to the development of Alzheimer's? The answer is no. There is a study, ongoing study in China, but they treat patients with Alzheimer's disease, kind of, you know, neat state, with a cycle. They want to see if they can inhibit replication of purpose virus, maybe to kind of mitigate the development of Alzheimer's. That makes sense? And what I find really revolutionary thought is that they challenge the common sort of, you know, idea. What, what generally we consider as Alzheimer's disease? It's the age-related deterioration of the brain. I usually say number one, everybody's going to get Alzheimer's. The only question is, are we going to die before or after? Right? Seriously, it's, it's like some people will get it at 90, but they may not make it to So what these authors, and there were some other uh, publications showing the link between other infectious diseases and Alzheimer's. What they suggest is that when you are immunocompetent, you're healthy, 40, 50, 60, whatever, and you positive for HSV1, purpose virus particles get into your brain, which is not good. So the brain produces an immune response. And I want to take immune response in a quotation. Basically, it produces beta amyloid plaques and tau protein fibers to restrict the movement of the virus in the brain. Does that make sense? Now, 
it prevents, this response prevents the infection, but it leaves that local lesion. And when these lesions accumulate, so the more times herpes gets in the brain, the more lesions accumulate in the brain, the more Alzheimer's deterioration you can see in the brain. So what they essentially suggest that Alzheimer's is um, a bystander effect of the unique immune response that brain cells are capable of. It hasn't been confirmed. I think it's a very elegant hypothesis. There are there's some circumstantial evidence that this hypothesis may be true, but I just wanted to update on that. You know, the role of herpes in outside. Any questions? If not, we're going to wrap it up.